So, good afternoon, Paul. Good afternoon and greetings to everyone on this very auspicious day of Visakha Puja, the day when we celebrate the birth, the enlightenment, and the death, the passing away of the Buddha. And this is one of the most important days of the year in the Buddhist calendar. So I thought I'd make this video as a kind of offering, celebration of Visakha Puja. People have sent in questions to ask me and I will do my best to answer them. Thank you. So the first question um, is in regards to how some governments, organizations or companies have responded successfully to the COVID-19 pandemic, whereas in some cases they have not. And there's a lot of uh, resentment, anger or blame. How to deal with that, Lumpur? Okay. Well, the, the tendency to blame is so strong in in, uh, in us as human beings. <clears throat> I noticed in myself the, you know, feeling that who's to blame is a kind of immediate kind of reaction to a unfortunate situation. And uh, this coronavirus pandemic is, you know, people are, everybody's blaming somebody else for it. It's like, the Chinese or the bats or Trump or something, you know, that we can, some object that we can blame. And to deal with this is the way to learn uh, developing wisdom is just observing this tendency to blame, wanting to find out who's at fault and the, or they shouldn't have done this, but just to be the witness the observer of your tendency, your habitual tendency to blame governments or individual leaders or your mates or friends or whatever for things that go wrong or things you don't like. This, uh, this, uh, this is, because this is a, a strong tendency that the personal sense of self, this sense of I am this this person, this body sitting here, this is me and, and uh, my sense of what's right and wrong. And, uh, and if somebody doesn't quite respect me or my rights or my views and opinions about right and wrong, then they're to blame. You know, I blame them, those who don't agree with me or disagree with me. So this is a, a way of cultivating mindfulness, being aware not that no one's to blame for things, I'm not saying that, but just observing your own reactions because they're, to blame somebody else is, is, a, is almost an immediate reaction. Who's at fault? Who's, who's responsible for this? Who messed this up? Who did the wrong thing? And just listen to yourself blaming uh, governments or leaders of governments or other members of the society. Just be the one who knows the Puru, who ru, who told the, the knowing, the witness to the blaming habits that you have. And in the, I guess a similar vein, there's another question regarding the difficulty that some people find at receiving either blame or even compliments. And uh, reacting to them, like if someone blames us, we sort of get outraged, or if someone pays us a compliment, then we don't know how to take that either. And kind of we're afraid of becoming arrogant. How does one respond to both those situations? Well, it's praise and blame go together. You know, we, they're worldly, they're considered a part of the eight worldly dhammas, praise and blame, because as individuals, 
as individual beings, we, we're subject to people compliments or praise and also they're, they're blaming us for disappointing them or disillusioning them or misguiding them or not doing the right thing. Uh, because this is what the, the, the deluded sense of self does. It, it's always, you know, you, 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 we're conditioned in our culture to, to live in a world of ideas, ideals about how things should be, like democratic uh, systems of government should be fair and just, there should be equality and freedom, uh, human rights in every way, free to do what we say, free to, free, free to say what we do and, and whatever. Uh, so, these ideals, you know, in the especially being brought up in the United States, you're brought up with with very fine, high-minded ideals. And as you grow up, you begin to realize that the world you live in, uh, that that they're, they're not living, people are not living, the government's not living up, the society's not a real democracy or a real place of freedom, as it as you see it and translate it into your ideals of what should be. And to point out that ideals are the, the summum bodum, the top of uh, thinking, you know, we create ideals. Of, we all know how a government should be, how a partner should be, how a man should be, how a woman should be, how a society should be. We can recite that in a, in a few minutes automatically. And of course, that's a, an ideal world. And ideals can be perfect, you know, because they, they aren't part of the realm of, of, of uh, feeling. Ideals don't feel anything. They're just like marble statues. They're perfect in their form. They're beautiful to observe. But they they don't live in a realm of sensation. They're not sentient. They're not alive. And yet we compare ourselves with ideals. We compare our societies with ideals. Compare others with with ideals. And of, of course, when you do that, you're you're not you're, you're always going to see that you you know nothing's an ideal as it, as it, as you think it should be. And you look at yourself. Uh, just looking at yourself, uh, you have ideals of how you should be, but can you really live up to ideals that you hold for yourself at every moment of your life? And when you when you kind of fail in living up to your high standards, your principles, your ideals, then you 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 think you're not good, you're unworthy, you're you're uh, criminal, you're, you're tainted, you're scarred for life, because uh, this is the way the thinking mind is. It, it tends to criticize. You, you're, say, you're, you're holding to, attached to, maybe a very fine ideal or principle or standard of behavior. And then when you don't kind of match up to it, then you you feel inferior or you, you're disappointed with yourself or you're self-critical. So this awareness that the, the, these conditions that we live with, the human form, the sensory world, is not an ideal world. The body's not an ideal, human body's not an ideal human body. It's not, you know, because it, you can idealize of how it should be, but it, it's going to get old, get sick and die because that's its very nature. And that's not an ideal. Old age, sickness, death are not ideals, but that they are pointing to the way things actually are, that old age, sickness, death are part of the human experience. Uh, and this identity with the human form and with mental ideals of you know, that never change, that are static and permanent in your, in your consciousness, uh, are, they are something to, to admire and to work toward, but also 
in wisdom, we open to the way things are. We adapt. We have to live our lives in a changing, unpredictable way. And this uh, present time, the coronavirus is, you know, who wants that? That's not part of the ideal society that has conquered sickness and and has responded to the coronavirus epidemic ideally as they should have. Uh, so, you know, then we tend to criticize and feel let down, disappointed or angry uh, about it, about the, the lack of uh, proper response to a very uh, critical situation. But the, the emphasis of this reflection is based on is encouraging you to observe the state of mind, you know, how you do hold to principles and ideals in a way that you're, you're not really aware of. It's not that you should discard them, but this, this kind of ignorant grasping of how things should be is going to be the cause of much suffering for you in your life. And when you let go of ideals, this doesn't mean you uh, delete them or get rid of them. It means that you can adapt, respond to contingencies, to special situations as they arise, where an ideal is does, doesn't respond to contingencies or special situations or events. It's always perfect or in, under any event, under any condition, but the life as we experience it as human beings is about change, impermanence, not ideal society and ideal partners, ideal family, uh, ideal response to, to, to crises, but we can be aware. And that awareness is, is perfect. As we begin to trust the awareness that we truly are, we're not, to, and we're not the, the physical body. The body is not self. Your your ideals are not self. Your your feelings, your emotions, your passions, your anger is not self. It arises and ceases according to other conditions, and we can observe it. You know when you're angry. You know when you're jealous. You know when you're frightened. When you're thinking negatively when you're responding with anger and resentment because you, you've either disappointed yourself or somebody or some institution has disappointed you. And praise also, <clears throat> you know, most of us like praise. We like to be praised. But some people, you know, who hold themselves through their critical mind, through seeing their uh, emphasizing their imperfections or their faults when they're praised they feel uh, you know it's it's uh, they don't know how to receive praise how to be appreciated because they themselves don't appreciate or understand themselves very well so in terms of being praised winning prizes being champion it's you know, it, we can still reflect when we are in a position of winning the race and being the best. It's like this. We don't have to grasp that and become, you know, arrogant through the praise and accolades that we receive in life, but we can certainly enjoy them. Is there a part of, uh, th th there's part of receiving praise when one's afraid of becoming arrogant. Don't be afraid about becoming arrogant. <laughs> you know, if you start grasping praise and needing it, you know, like you're demanding others appraise, uh, praise you, uh, that's arrogant. And expecting to be praised and appreciated and loved and <clears throat> admired and, and your friends and and colleagues are all completely loyal to you. That's arrogance. But, uh, you, you know, when you're reflecting, when you're reflecting on the way things are, you can easily detect arrogance by 
recognizing how you you need somebody else to approve of you to feel worthy because you you don't know who you are you you think you are all kinds of things and you're afraid you're not the best or you you might fail in life and so you need constant reinforcement from those around you to say how good how wise how intelligent how good looking you you are be observant if that's a part of your problem you you can be aware of that why do i need other people approval for me to feel happy today well, you know so <clears throat> when happiness is my very nature you know it's not i'm got i need to get it somebody else to say something nice to make me happy if i do need that i can be aware of it also be you know aware of how needy emotionally needy i am <clears throat> in order to feel happy today and and i trust that awareness not the habit patterns and personal reactions that i have to situations but i i really trust this witnessing this observing this reflecting on the way it is and i so i encourage all of you to do the same there's another question was uh, what is wisdom and reflecting on wisdom and aspiring to develop wisdom what is wisdom well like in wisdom is there like there's worldly wisdom you can talk about you know being worldly wise knowing the ways of the world and having contemplated how to manipulate situations <laughs> but wisdom itself is is natural to us it's what a what we begin to trust when we're aware it's through awareness that wisdom ultimate wisdom can um operate through us through these forms and of course in the buddhist sense of all conditions are impermanent all dhamma ultimate reality is not a personal possession dhamma is not self they there's no permanent self uh, and all conditions are impermanent by investigating these these two phrases then the wisdom arises ultimate wisdom arises you begin to see you're not just taking the words out of the scriptures and believing them and you're not just believing all conditions are impermanent and ultimate reality is 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 not personal you're not you're not believing that anymore because uh, i might say that or you read it in in the in the buddhist canon but you know this it's through insight you, this is provable you know so you know the buddhist teachings of the four noble truths is it's not a belief system you're not asked to believe that there's suffering it's it's not something that anyone is going to believe in any way but pointing to there is suffering is pointing to here and now the the way that we see ourselves through uh the ego through the sense of i'm uh the best person or i'm the worst person or I'm what i should it shouldn't be you know we we're always going to create the suffering around what we're thinking what we're feeling emotionally what we remember remember the past how many of you remember the past uh, and how many uh, uh memories to bring back a uh, grief or sorrow or fear or guilt you know just by grasping memories that you're sitting in a very nice room in your condominium and you you're you're getting depressed because you remember things you've said and done in the past that you feel guilty about and wisdom steps in and is let go of that that's 
memories are, you know, have they're empty phenomena. They come and go. They're not a person. The memories of having done wrongs in the past, that's not a person. That's a memory that arises in the present, arises and ceases. So you begin to wisely reflect on the way it really is because a memory doesn't stay long, does it? They vanish in. Where did they vanish? After you remember some event in your life you're ashamed of, and then it, it, you, you forget it, it disappears. Where does it arise from and where does it disappear to? You know, and you can't find it anywhere. It has no, no kind of abode or residence, no place to, to return to. It just arises out of nothing and ceases in nothing. Or you can say arises in consciousness and ceases in consciousness. This is developing wisdom. You know, the, the, the wisdom is then your, your natural heritage as a human being. We, we, we can do, take a refuge in wisdom, in understanding through this reflective ability, this what they call Buddha nature or Buddha mind, the ability to reflect on the way it is. Because mindfulness isn't a personal possession. It's not like, my mindfulness is different from yours. Mindfulness isn't personal. It's the gate to the deathless. It's the, it's the path of liberation, developing, cultivating, trusting in awareness and mindfulness in consciousness here and now is the way to, to cultivate, to develop, to learn to trust in wisdom that is naturally what you are. So you're not trying to become a wise person because that will never happen. You know, none of us, you know, as a personality or a person uh, becomes wise because the personality, uh, the, the sense of me being a, a separate entity, a separate person, there's no wisdom in that. That's an illusion that I create. Uh, so that kind of person never develops any wisdom because... It, it, it's impermanent. It's a sankara. It can't, it can't be wise. But, uh, consciousness is not a sankara. Mindfulness is not some sankara that arises and ceases. Mindfulness is some, is that which doesn't arise and cease, which is still and peaceful and permanent. And w so when we take refuge in the Dhamma, that's what we're taking refuge in when we say uh, santitiko dhamma, apparent here and now. This this awareness here and now is is what we really are, and the awareness of what we we are of, you know, can be you know a, a, a memory from the past or some kind of fantasy for the future or or whatever you happen to be feeling in the moment that awareness of it allows yourself to see the suffering you create by grasping that, by holding to the limitations, the, the petty sense of yourself as a limited form, a, a mortal human body made out of food, and see yourself no longer in that limited form, that limited sense of right and wrong, good and bad, person, but in what you truly are is awareness itself, is consciousness, which is not personal. So it's a, it's an enormous relief not to be a person, to be trusting in awareness, because that's the path to the deathless, to the Amata Dhamma or deathless reality. So in the light of that, how to understand, this is another question, how to understand uh, when in the scriptures the Buddha is talking about a foolish person? The foolish person is the one who believes in that they are the human bodies they have. <laughs> and that they are their emotions and their feelings and their views, their concepts their memories. This is a foolish person. 
And that's what the Buddha is pointing to is, is the foolishness, uh, you know, that we identify with out of habit, not out of choice, but out of just being conditioned from infancy to think and to believe in certain things in a certain way, you know, because we're all conditioned from, from infancy to believe we are the, this human body. And in so many ways, it's a, it's a very strong sense of, of self that I am this physical body because the, the society we live in reinforced that delusion. Uh, even the religions, most religions reinforce that delusion that, that we are individually separate and we are the human forms that, that we're living in, that we're experiencing. And these forms, you know, can be male or female. It, it can be white or black or, you know, these, but these forms are definitely separate entities that we take very personally, how we look, whether we consider ourselves attractive or unattractive or the way we regard our sexual orientation becomes very personal. And so we create a whole sense of ourself with the limitations of these very personal perceptions that we create where wisdom is to is to see what we're doing because you can witness this you can observe you can observe how you grasp the identities political identities gender identities sexual orientation identities uh, nationalistic identities how these become or ideals you know about human rights and justice and fairness and equality you know, that how we blindly, ignorantly grasp these because we're conditioned to do so. So the whole point of Buddhist meditation practice is to observe, to see the suffering that we create out of this grasping of these perceptions, because that's all they are. They're not, in, they're not permanent individuals. Nobody's a permanent male or female or anything like that, the, the uh, ultimate Dhamma it isn't, doesn't have a gender. It's perfection itself. So we began, you know, where the foolish person is, is always limiting him, or, him and himself or herself to the physical appearance, to certain perceptions, certain concepts, ideas, values that they, they intimately grasp and exploit for, you know, to create more suffering where the liberation is through letting go of these, through not through destroying or annihilating these, these perceptions, but it's in recognizing that the suffering that we create through this habitual, reactive, blind grasping of identities with sankharas or conditioned phenomena. So the encouragement is to let go. And it's not a, like destroying, it's not annihilating sankars, it's not annihilating conditions or identities, but it's seeing, it's a witnessing the suffering that we create through this blind, ignorant grasping of identity with something that's really not self anyway. Thank you.